All right, good morning. My name is Vince Tidwell. I'm with Sandia National Laboratories, and I'll be talking a little bit about regional analysis of energy, water, land, and climate interactions. And I want to start by recognizing uh, Emily Silver, who helped a lot with uh, the data collection and maps that you'll be seeing throughout this analysis. Also, my other co-authors on this, actually, this work uh, kind of uh, grew out of uh, our work on the 2014 National Climate Assessment. Uh, in particular, as we put together Chapter 10, Energy, Water, and Land Use. And so not only the, the authors that helped with that, but also the technical report that we put together that kind of uh, helped uh, provide a, a platform for the, the later chapter. So all of these people have uh, contributed to this work in one way or the other. And so kind of the first place to start is why do we care about energy, water, and land and their interaction? Well, first off is that climate. It's going to affect energy, water, and land sectors in, in different ways. And also, not only the sectors themselves, but it's also going to affect the way each of these sectors interact with each other. And not only that, again, it's going to be affected, or these interactions and effects of climate are going to vary from location to location or regionally. And so if we really want to be able to be able to define climate change vulnerabilities, to understand how we might adapt or mitigate. We've got to understand these, these nuances, these interactions, and, and the combination with uh, climate change. And so it's this regionalization that I want to focus on this morning and how these interactions change geospatially around the nation. And here I'm just going to focus in on the continental U.S. And I want to look at this uh, geospatial difference in a couple of different ways. First, by the NCA regions, which are the different colored regions there, the six different regions. And then also by state. We have data to do county, but that gets a little uh, in, uh, too detailed at this point. And I, I know in a perfect world we'd like to do, you know, full multilateral analysis uh, across all of these different uh, 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 sectors. But in order to get our hands around this, and, and I think it makes it a little easier to, to break it down this way to begin with, is look at the various bilateral interactions to start with. And so looking at things like the effect of energy on water use and the effect of water, water on energy use and so forth. So what I want to do is, again, go through each one of these bilateral, these six different bilateral uh, interactions and look at both the spatial pattern at the state level, as you see up there in the top left, and uh, also aggregated at the uh, NCA region down on the bottom right. And in each case, I, I list the kind of data that we use to assemble these maps. And so for this first case, I want to look at the effect of energy or our choices about energy and how that affects our water use. And so in this case, we put information together from the amount of water used uh, for cooling for thermoelectric power plants, the amount of water used for extraction of fuel, so coal for natural gas, oil, and then also the water for biofuel production. This is just water withdrawn, not the, the green water, as well as the water for uh, the uh, conversion of the feedstock. And so uh, in this first case, you can see some real strong regionalization. You can uh, see, and I, I will say this is water. This is a million gallons per year, and it's for total withdrawals, and it includes both uh, saline and uh, fresh water. And you can see a real regionalization. It's much higher here in, in the east more so than in the West, except for California. Uh, the big driver in this, of course, is uh, the choice of, uh, well, is thermoelectric cooling, and uh, in, in particular, the choice in uh, cooling type. And so throughout much of the East, you have open-loop cooling, which is very water-intensive, as well as here on the West Coast of California. And so you can see this pattern, and it in, in, uh, largely driven by uh, thermoelectric water use. We see a very uh, uh, a complete change in the patterns here when we start talking about the effect of water and our choices about water and its effect on energy use. Here, so we're talking about the energy to pump water for irrigation, surface and groundwater, the energy to move and treat drinking water and wastewater. So here, this is in megawatts per hour. Uh, per year, megawatt hours per year, and you can see here that it's much more concentrated, much higher here in the west than in the east, as uh, Kristen was talking about, largely due to uh, pumping for irrigation, so most of our irrigation is out west, and so a very different pattern than what we saw before. In this case, now we're looking at and thinking about the effect or our choices of land and how we use it and that effect on energy use. And so here, we're just looking at primary energy consumption, so for transportation, for our homes, 
uh, industry, uh, buildings, etc. And so here, the dominant is, is, is population. So the higher the, the population centers largely, we see larger energy use. So areas like California, Texas, New York, uh, Illinois, you have pretty high energy use. But there's still other places like Louisiana here because of very high industrial uh, energy use, you see it it's showing up pretty strongly. So again, a little more high in, in, in the east uh, uh, in this particular case and, and pretty high or some level of energy use across all the different sectors. Uh, or all of uh, the different regions. Here, the impact or our decisions about energy and how that affects land use. And so in this case, we're looking at acres of land for, uh, for power plants. And so largely uh, solar and wind farms, land for energy extraction, so land impacted by coal, oil, uh, gas mining, and then also uh, the land for biofuel cultivation. And here, as you might expect, particularly for biofuels, the Midwest here, uh, fairly high. Uh, you see here the, the uh, Plain State, places like New York, the Northwest is, is driven uh, largely by wind. And then also places with combined effects also for uh, uh, energy extraction. So in Texas for natural gas and oil, same a bit in California. Here are some in the Marcellus. So uh, again, a uh, bit of a different pattern than we've seen here, a little bit more heavily uh, uh, intense use here more in the middle part of the U.S., the Plains and the uh, Midwest. Now, in, in terms of water and our choices about water and how that affects land use, and here I've broken this up in two different ways because there's, I, I think there are very different ways of, of considering water in terms of green water. So where there's uh, natural abundant rainfall, uh, that would be, you know, that could support unirrigated agriculture and, and forest. And so here you see uh, basically green water, uh, so and its effect on so for dry farming and, and forest. And so you can see it's pretty high here in the Midwest, in places here in, in the southeast, uh, forest here in, in the, the, the northwest, and is also northern part of California. This is in contrast if we look at the blue water. So this would be the water where we're extracting it uh, to use for various purposes like irrigation, reservoirs, or urban. And so in this case, very strongly dominated by irrigation, uh, water use, California, Texas, here in the, the Ogallala area, uh, some along the Mississippi Valley and, and, and Florida. So uh, again, the blue water, you can see, uh, uh, let's see here see the difference and I can't see, there we go. You can see a, a strong difference in, in the two different cases between the two different sources of water. And then finally, uh, the, the choices about land and how that affects water use. And so here we're looking at all different kinds of water use, again, withdrawals in terms of million gallons per year uh, for everything except energy. So largely for irrigation, for uh, industrial, municipal, domestic use. And again, here you can see a pretty strong uh, regional pattern with higher use uh, tending to be in the west where a lot of our irrigation is occurring. So we can pull all of this together and, and uh, kind of compare these different maps here. Uh, these are the energy water uh, uh, pairs. Here's the land energy pairs and the water land pairs. And so again, if, if you just step back and take a look at it, you can see very clearly that there are very significant regional differences, uh, state to state differences, and it differs strongly depending on the, uh, uh, the, the interaction uh, that we're looking at. Uh, you can see a real strong uh, high east, low west, high west, low east, a bit of a high west, lower east here. Uh, you can also see in different cases that, you know, it does tend to regionalize a bit. You know, it's low here in the northwest, high in the northwest, higher, kind of low, high. So the, the areas in, in many cases, this, although it doesn't follow the NCA region very well, but you can see that these regions, these areas tend to fall. These are all kind of low. These are all kind of high here, kind of low here, medium here. So you can see a regionalization of a lot of these processes as well. Now, one of the problems that we're still working with here, but you can see in all these cases, the far northeast is always low. Texas, California is always high. That's because we haven't uh, normalized our data either by the size of the state or the population. That's something we're still working on and still need to do. And 
if, if it, you're not convinced enough, you can see here by the different NCA regions, uh, the, the differences that, you know, for each of these bilateral uh, interactions, you can see their big difference here. You know, these three are dominated by the southeast. These are pretty low for the southeast. All of them have pretty high for the, the Great Plains except the energy on water use. So bottom line is, as we'd hope to see, you know, there are these big differences, uh, regional differences. But, you know, we just look at this, what does this tell us? We need to go to the next step into trying to interpret what all of this means. And so uh, we've come up with a pretty simple model. Uh, basically, it looks at the demand, the endowment, and technology, a DET model, basically. And, and the idea is to understand these bilateral interactions that you need to know something about the resource uh, that is making a demand of one type and its influence and how it interacts with the other resource that is being, that is required to be supplied for that other uh, uh, resource. And then also that within each of these you have to understand a little bit about the, the physical or, or natural setting and influences on that resource as well as the engineered or, or physical setting or engineered or, or human uh, uh, impacts on that system. So for example, here's the, the effect of energy on water use. And so in this case, if we think about electricity as uh, one of our, uh, of, of the energy, and that electricity generates, generation requires water. And so water is a measure of, of the, the endowment that we're looking at. One way of, 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 of improving that uh, supply is through engineered systems of reservoirs, and the amount of water required, say, for electricity generation depends, again, on the engineered system, the choices we make about the cooling systems. Uh, we can put all this together and understand this big east to west difference that we saw a moment ago in, in the water for, or the energy uh, impacts on water use in the fact that uh, where we have very good runoff, high water availability. Our choice of cooling systems is followed using a lot of open loop cooling uh, to power our systems. And so uh, it helps explain that regional difference that we see here. And also recognizing that things like greenhouse gas policy uh, and, and its relationship to climate is going to have a difference regional effect uh, in the fact that uh, depending on the kinds of systems which use these large open loop cooling systems will be differentially impacted by the greenhouse gas policy and there'll be differences from east to west. And so you can go through here and look at each of these different systems and, and begin to interpret them and interpret these regional differences. And so uh, with that, I, I will uh, leave it here. The, basically the summary is we do see strong uh, variations regionally and we have a model here for beginning to interpret uh, what these differences mean. And so with that, I'd be happy to take any questions that you might have.